Hello, everyone. I am Professor Geek. Welcome back. Not Professor Geek. I'm the Catholic Bible Geek. I'm also the Professor Geek. Getting my channels all mixed up again. But welcome back to the Catholic Bible Geek channel. And welcome to another installment of our Chronicles of Narnia book study. And it's actually the first installment of our Silver Chair study. So we're going to be uh, taking that on here in just a moment. But uh, let's see what's going on here. Let me welcome with me as always. I do have a different, uh, different co-host tonight. So for this book, you know, I know um, Reap Out Cheap's been fun and everything, but we had to, you know, we had to kind of send him on his way. He wanted to go stay on the uh, in the east with Aslan. So he said, OK, who are we to who are we to stand in the way of that? So we went ahead and let Reap, Cheap, Reap Out Cheap go. But tonight instead, I'd like to welcome our, our new co-host for the book streams, Mr. Put Al Glum. Welcome, Put Al Glum. Hello, how are you doing? I don't know why I'm here. I don't even know if I can even offer anything. <laughs> I don't even know if the if I know anything about the book, even though I read it. It probably won't be very good anyway. If you yeah, say it's probably not good. I'm sure nobody's listening either. Why would anybody <laughs> listen to this? <laughs> I love that. You did such a great job. I knew you'd, you, you've only met him for a little bit now, but you'll come to like him even more as the book goes on, I'm sure. <clears throat> he strikes me as one of the well, characters. we'll have to see. I don't really know now, but... <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably. Who knows? Well, I think you'll really like him. Actually, he's a great character. Well, yeah. it's good for uh, the good face of it, but you know. It's okay. Yeah, okay, enough of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I liked him. I Because I, you had informed me that there was going to be a character I was really going to like. Mm -hmm. And I immediately, when we got to him, I thought it was going to be uh, the owl. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, and I was like, too. he's cool. I was like, I started thinking, it's like, I can make myself an owl. And, that's <laughs> a, and I got the puddle gum. <laughs> I was like, that's who he was talking about. Yep, yep. Puddle gum. And it's a perfect name. It's, it's like your name is, is perfectly suited to, to smush in there. Puddle gum. Yeah. Puddle gum. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, so welcome to the chat and first up in the chat tonight and uh, first in my heart as always, but also this is her day. This is her big day. So happy birthday to my dear sound engraver. Everybody's cheering in the chat. We just can't hear them because they're not on mic. I'd wish her a happy birthday, but who knows what kind of a day she's having and if it's happy or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's happy because I went to go see her this past weekend to celebrate her birthday over her birthday weekend. And uh, I, I left some some gifts and things for her for today and some things to be delivered to her today. So she's got a happy birthday as well. So uh, I saw to it like a good boyfriend. Well, hopefully they made it, but probably not. <laughs> uh, welcome to Matthew Flynn as well. And uh, let's see. Oh, this is his favorite Narnia book. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's been a while. You know, this is the next. This is the penultimate book in our in our Narnia book study, because next is Last Battle, and then we're done uh, with the Chronicles of Narnia. Anyway, we're not done with Lewis, or nor are we done with book studies by any means. Now, I I, <laughs> I I get the impression that this book was written before A Horse and His Boy. I think so. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think or so. At least, he, or at least he knew about it because he mm-hmm. mentions it. Yeah, he 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 uh, references the the tale. You know, the the bards are singing of it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's another tale to tell. I just don't know if it's because the way he sounded it's like, well, it's the book to come. Yeah, yeah. And uh, welcome to Daniel Heron. Welcome to Dev. Welcome to oh, let me scroll down and see us. Welcome to welcome to Netters Network. Welcome to Schooner Tuna, Samuel Proctor, Jedi Master Zetopia. Schooner, oh, Schooner Tuna said that. We'll probably have Wolf 10 Media in here at some point, but uh, got quite a few more people watching than joining in the chat. So welcome to everyone. Great to see everybody. I uh, Daniel Heron was asking for a pre-show. I actually did plan on a pre-show for tonight, and I had uh, I had something in mind. Maybe if I've got enough uh, energy at the end of the study, I might uh, still talk about it a little bit. But I ended up taking a nap, a little power nap before the study. And it, I slept way over. I think uh, I don't sleep much, you know, when I'm uh, on the weekends with Sound Engraver because I don't want to waste time sleeping. I want to be with Sound Engraver, you know. So um, there's that. And then this morning, I usually get to sleep in a bit on Tuesdays, but I ended up having to jump up and, and do some shipping and, and take care of some tasks. So I uh, closed my eyes for a power nap. You know, I'm usually up within a half hour tops. But it was like an hour and a half later, I woke up and then um, I still had just enough time to jump on the mic and, and maybe do a little bit of a pre-show. But I got this notification, the Fratellis have this new album out. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, let me just give a listen a little bit of it, you know, while I'm while I'm uh, prepping for the stream. And it sounded amazing. It was like, I don't know if you guys are Fratellis fans. They're a trio, a Scottish rock trio. And they came out like in the early 2000s with just some kind of good guitar rock. But they do do uh, other stuff, too. The lead singer was uh, formed the Codeine Velvet Club, which is kind of like not big band, but sort of more club band-ish, jazzy underground kind of stuff and this album of the fratellis is drawing on that influence a lot it was really sweet so just listening to okay. it you're in that See, post-snap haze and you're kind of like uh okay i'll go out of stream so lost okay me. cbg uh you're talking about a fr- uh fratellis new album when there was a much more significant album that dropped today oh yes i know my my goodness oh. yes. well technically it dropped, it dropped last night well, Still. These, it's the it's before midnight. I listen. I was the first one to listen to that whole album. She she said she said it's dropped, and I miss Sound Engraver's uh, anomaly um, album. Happy <clears throat> <me>. anomaly. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little soda going down the wrong pipe. Happy anomaly dropped last night, and uh, on Bandicamp, I bought it immediately, even though I'd already purchased it a number of different ways, and uh, it's great. Yeah. Uh, about 34 music, minutes of music, I think she said, and I listened to it all the way through. It was a wonderful work music last night. So very true. I listened to a uh, a few uh, tracks myself today. I haven't bought it yet. I shall though. Yeah. <laughs> um, Daniel Heron said the guy, the bad guys from the Goonies have an album now. You know, I've often thought that's where they named their band from. I don't know for sure, but none of them are actually named for Telly in the band. So that I kind of think they might have got that. Has that. to be it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of freaky when I, when uh, I'm talking and you look up into the camera. It's almost like you're looking at me. Hi, Al. Oh, those Al. beautiful eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Get lost in them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, oh, Sound Engraver. You, see, you got me in trouble. She said, thanks, Al, for bringing it up before the prof. Uh-huh. See, he was going about some other album. And you of know, course. You know what's funny about that? I thought before I clicked live, I thought, make sure you wish Sound Engraver a happy birthday because you know Al's going to jump in and try and say it first and then try and make it a big thing that you didn't say it before he said it. And so I was like, yes, got it in there before Al. And then Al remembers something else to say. So Slam dunk. Slam dunk. <laughs> none, of, none of the wonderful things I did for Sound Engraver this weekend, I guess, count because I didn't mention her birth, her, uh, her album first. So uh, See, yeah, I, she I, I've, I've made all that pale in comparison. <laughs> took it down all of it down uh but yeah she's got the link there and uh that is where you can still obtain the album you know you can't it's not gone forever you know she had a a campaign up for it to to pay for mastering fees but uh it's still there still an excellent excellent listen so check that out melissa harrison sons joining us here just as we're about to dig in so that's good to see all right so uh al we kind of jumped the gun a little bit and talked about it but just in general you're you know for those who don't know al's never Al, before we did this uh, Chronicles of Narnia study, Al had read through The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe once ages ago. But that was it. So all of these books, and Al's only reading it at the pace that we're reading it for the study. 
fifth grade. So I was 10. Fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> so um, having read through what we've read thus far, what do you think of uh, silver chair? Just having dug into the first five chapters, just general impression. Um, I'm kind of digging it. It's a, it's a, it's a nice setting up a nice little adventure. Um, of course, you know, we, we are welcoming back a once again, though, not quite as bratty Eustace and then sometimes equally insufferable girl. <laughs> so you think Eustace is still bratty? He's, he has his moments. He's better. He's mm -hmm. much, much better. And I think the Narnian air will do him well. Yeah, as it, we've seen it, yeah, already. Yeah, you're right, though, Um, and and Jill Pohl, her name, it's kind of funny that we have Eustace Scrub and Jill Pohl. Neither of them are very uh, eloquent names, you know, <laughs> or elegant mm -hmm. names, but uh, so Scrub, and, and they each call each other by their last name. Scrub, yeah, Pohl, what? <laughs> you know, so they've got these... Um, it sounds like, it's, I think it's like a very British school thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know, people used to call me Kreitzer in school, too. Well, because if you, well, I mean, I don't know how effect you know, what an example might be, but if when you watch the Harry Potter films, they're always going like Potter, Granger, Weasley. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, they're always being refer referred to by their, by their last names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's just a British thing or not. I do, I do remember being called by my last name quite a bit in school, but uh, we, we are, we are in the school, the experimental school as they keep calling it. And this is the school that Lewis had already introduced when he talked about Eustace in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, this, this special school. And we have those kind of, I mean, I, there's some here where I live and there, there are those everywhere still, but apparently they existed even in Lewis's day. And you know, the type of school that doesn't believe in discipline, you know, we just believe in talking and don't squelch their personality. And, uh, you know, we can't have, and it's very much, you know, in today's kind of woke ideology agenda it's funny to see it evident even back there in lewis's day and these types of schools that oh we can't talk about anything that would have even remotely a, a shade of religion in it you know so when they get to narnia they're called sons of sons of adam and daughters of eve as they've been in narnia and at one point it says uh but since they go to the experimental school they've never heard of adam or you so they don't know what he's talking about you know it's now, well, of course today you wouldn't be able to say son or daughter Oh, that's right. We don't want to, you know, offspring of Adam and or Eve <laughs> would be the, the gender neutral way. <laughs> so ridiculous. Uh, of course, you know, Adam and Eve is a biblical thing. Maybe we shouldn't even mention that. No, that's right. Offspring of evolution, <laughs> <laughs> of, of blind, un, un, uh, undirected, undesigned evolution. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, crazy, crazy type of school. But we also see one. Um, effect or, or consequence of that type of school right from the beginning is that it allows bullies because there's no discipline you got bullies running rampant and the first time we meet poor jill in fact she's the first character we meet she's hiding behind the gym crying because she's been bullied we're never told exactly what the bullying looks like but we we're we're given enough to know that it's pretty extreme and probably physical too you know it's mm. not just uh, calling names or something like that it's probably cuz they're actually running from these people who are chasing them trying to catch them you know so uh Eustace it, it, it's this wonderful first chapter go ahead and um it seems like even the even the staff don't really care no no it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like a, a social ex like, you know, in their name, experiment. It's like a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a social issue to be observed rather yeah. than uh, influenced. Yeah, it even said that the, uh, the those who do the bullying, well, they're they're um, kind of considered favorites because, oh, they're, they're such a unique case. Let's study them. Oh, they had a rough upbringing, you know, this and that. I remember that kind of stuff going on in school when I grew up. The, mm -hmm. the ones who were the worst and treated everybody the worst are the ones who, you know, they were the guidance counselor's favorites, you know, <laughs> and got special treatment and special clubs and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's because they were <laughs> always in their office getting talked to. So exactly. <laughs> you get to know them more. Exactly. Exactly. And um, <clears throat> let's see. So, uh, we find out that Eustace actually has usually been not one of the bullies himself, but one of the, the kind of ones who suck up to the bullies, you know? Um, I think it even says that. I think he even uses that phrase sucking up to the bullies yeah. at one point, a but toady. Uh, a toady. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. And Jill kind of shames Eustace about that a little bit, but Eustace is taking, he's like, are you kidding me? Haven't I done this? Haven't I stood up for this and, and done all this stuff this year? You know, he's made a change since he's gone away. Cause it was during the holiday, the school holidays, you know, the summer basically 
or um, that, that he had the John Treader uh, experience with with Edmund and Lucy. You know, he's back at school and he's changed his ways. And, and Jill has to admit that, yes, he has been quite different. But because of that, the bullies are going to be after him pretty soon. She's overheard them saying, yeah, we're going to have to teach him a lesson since he's no longer in our entourage, you know. <clears throat> so uh, Eustace actually tells Jill because he sees that she's in, in so much torment and they both hate the, the school so much they hate being there it's a boarding school on top of it so they can't leave for the day i mean there's just no go going anywhere and he and he tells her a little bit about this place narnia has gone to he, and he says that at the end you know um aslan he doesn't really tell her much about aslan in particular but he tells her about the you know the place in general and he does say that his cousins were both told that they would not be able to enter in anymore but he didn't say anything about him not being able to enter in so therefore he, he takes mm -hmm. it as, as he might be able to so he, he has Go ahead. She, she, uh, he does mention his name. <clears throat> he does mention, yeah, but she, he didn't tell yeah. her that he's a lion or anything, or you know, he created the place or, or much about him. You know, just uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, because she has to kind of put that together when she meets him in a bit. Um, but the, he has her uh, basically. It's basically prayer. It's a supplication. It's a uh, you know, please let us into as uh, and let us back into Narnia. So they they stand with their hands outstretched. And uh, this ties into a little bit of what I was going to say in the pre-show. Maybe I'll get around to it at the end. And, uh, and they basically pray, you know, to, to be allowed back in the Narnia. Then they hear the bullies coming. They have to rush into the back of these woods. There's a, a wall. You know, some schools are kind of bordered with a wall or whatever. There's a door in it that's usually locked, but they're going to go try it anyway, because where else do they have to run? And as they open the door, sure enough, Narnia is on the other side. So they dash through. They're safe at that point. They're in this other world. Now, Jill doesn't know what's happening. You know, she puts it together. Obviously, this is the place that Eustace was talking about. But, you know, is he was he really tr saying thing the true or was he just crazy or whatever? You know, so she's she's wow. Realizing that <clears throat> they do find themselves on this giant cliff, though, a giant cliff's edge. And here comes where I think Al's you're getting at some of the the, you know, the Jill herself seems a little, you know, use the word bratty. But I think it's um it's a specific type of behavior. We see them very competitive with each other. Yeah, she's um, yeah, comp yeah well, competitive. By uh, there's another word, but yeah, she's she's definitely uh, trying to make sure she doesn't come off as meek or just just some silly girl. You yeah, know, she's yeah. stronger than that. Mm -hmm. and she doesn't. She wants to be. It's a competitive thing between him and her. Um, mm -hmm. They're both good people on their own right, but they do let this competitive thing. Uh, you know, it could be look at the competition between a boy and a girl, like you're saying, you know, um, anything you can do, I can do better kind of thing. Perhaps, you know, the kids, you know, they have that thing. But anyway, they're on the edge and used to saying, look out, look out, you know, because they realize they're right there on it. And Jill's initial instinct is to don't tell me to look out like I'm some weak person. I'll, I'll step a little bit closer to it and show you how I'm not. Then she sees how far down they really are or, or up. They really are. She goes, whoa. You know, and she realizes that. So they're so far up they're above the clouds and you look mm -hmm. down you can see nothing but a bank of clouds and then they look like a, a row of sheep and then suddenly you see through the, that and you realize how much farther down the ground actually is and uh in stepping forward she thinks that uh she's going to eustace thinks she's going to fall so he steps forward to try and save her but he actually ends up taking a tumble off the cliff mm -hmm. and it all happens very quickly in this moment once he's tumbled off suddenly this this creature this this figure sweeps up behind Jill and stands on the edge of the cliff and she realizes it's a great lion. It's a huge lion and it's on the edge of the cliff, but it's blowing. It's blowing out of you know wind out of its air, uh, you know, jaws. And it starts to um she sees the figure of Eustace. He's basically blowing Eustace rather than falling straight to the ground. He's blowing him off to someplace she doesn't know where. And she realizes this creature is a lion. Uh eventually it um Let's see, how does it say? Uh, Eustace himself was a terrified scream. He lost the balance. And she was nearly fainting indeed. She wished she could really faint, but faints don't come for the asking. <laughs> At last she saw far away below her a tiny black speck floating away from the cliff and slightly upwards as it rose. It also got further away. By the time it was nearly on the level with the cliff top, it was so far off that she lost sight of it. It was obviously moving away from them at a great speed. Jill couldn't help thinking that the creature at her side was blowing it away. So she turned and looked at the creature it was a lion. So now she's face to face with this lion. Remember, she doesn't know that Aslan's a lion. This is all very new to her. Yeah. I like the I like the one part where she looked down. She's like her legs seemed to have turned into putty. Every yeah. everything was swimming before her eyes. 
It's yeah. exactly how I feel when I when I get up high. Yeah, and, I, and I freak out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I found out in a very bad way when I went to the top of the Eiffel Tower at uh, King's Dominion. King's Dominion. Uh, yeah, really? Yeah, That's where I, I didn't. I did not know I had a fear of heights, and I found out, and I was terrified. I think you told me that once. Yeah, mm-hmm. I um I used to be afraid of heights growing up, but then I got a job in a in a movie theater, and it was an old movie theater in the, in the marquee sign out front was separate it was like standing in the in the dry parking lot and it was high up and the only way i could get the job was if i agreed to change the marquee because they needed somebody who would do it so i'd have to put on these coveralls i have to bring out this rickety old ladder you know and, and chain it to the to the sign climb up all the way to the top of the ladder then reach up and, and grab the the because there was a little platform up there grab that pull myself up and then once i was up there in the platform i had to like hook myself onto it I was terrified the first time I did it, but I realized I won't have a job if I don't do this. And I just kind of got over my fear of heights because of it. So it was pretty, actually a pretty cool view from up there. But uh, that's a digression. Anyway, <laughs> uh, fear of heights. He does, And this is good writing. And Lewis, Lewis explains it in a way that children can really understand. Even if a child isn't afraid of heights, they can feel that. You know, when you're going to write about your character feeling something, especially, especially in extreme emotion, you have to locate that feeling in the body. You know, give your readers the only thing your readers can have to put them there in the story or in the scene is the senses. And we always go on sight. You know, you want to describe what what your characters are seeing, but but don't neglect the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the sense of hearing. You know, you've got to, you know, taste even, you know, you've got to put those in there and and locate them in the body, the physical body. So, yeah, her knees felt like putty. You know, that's a that's a good, you know, good example. So uh, in Chapter two, <clears throat> Jill. Uh, rises up that the lion goes away and she realizes that she's quite thirsty crazy thirsty actually from the running from them and then from the fright uh from 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 seeing a lion you know all these kind of trials you know quite dried her out so she's uh she's off looking for this stream and she goes to this stream and finds the lions there the lion's sitting right by the stream staring at her and i love this uh this this dialogue they have the uh the lion says if you're thirsty, you may drink. They were the first words she had heard since Scrub had spoken to her on the edge of the cliff. For a second, she sta- started. She stared here and there, wondering who had spoken them. Then the voice said again, if you are thirsty, come and drink. And of course, she remembered that Scrub had said about animals talking in that other world, and realized that it was the lion speaking. Anyway, she hadn't seen its lips move this. She had seen its lips move this time, and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper, wilder, and stronger, a sort of heavy golden voice. It did not make her any less frightened than she had been before, but it made her frightened in a rather different way. Now we know of, uh, you know, this is very much Jesus imagery, imagery standing by the stream saying, come and drink, you know, of, of the water that, you know, living water and so forth. And they've, and they've mentioned before, like when, when he talks, there's, there's <clears> a fear, <throat> but it's different. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like we're going to talk about, there's a, power, there's a power about it. Exactly. And we're going to talk about what that fear is uh, in our, a little bit here in a second. He's, are you not thirsty? Said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do? Said Lil, gaze, as she gazed at its uh, motionless. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? Said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? She said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh, dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could do that. And her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she had ever had to do, but she went forward to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. 
Before she tasted it, it had been intended. She had been intending to make a dash away from the lion the moment she had finished. Now she realized that this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all. She got up and stood there with her lips still wet from drinking. Come here, said the lion. She had to. She was almost between his front paws now, looking straight into his face, but she couldn't stand that for long. She dropped her eyes. Uh, so then we, you know, then the wonderful, I'll get to the dialogue. They're going to talk here in a second, <clears throat> more of that. But I just wanted to cover what, what they're happening here. That Lewis is giving us a wonderful picture, a wonderful scene, but it's a picture of, you know, this plays into what I was going to talk about <clears throat> during the pre-show, how everybody needs, we all have that need for God. Not just God, we have a need for religion. And, you know, religion is, you know, I'll get to that later, <clears throat> but we have that need for something spiritual. We have that need in us for God, ultimately, but before we know who God is and who Christ is, we just kind of contextualize that as some sort of spiritual need. You know, um, atheists just don't last. It's been my experience that atheists don't last long in the world 100% completely atheist to the core. By that, I mean completely materialistically atheist. Like there is nothing more than this matter around us. My emotions are simply just neural chemicals in my brain. They don't mean anything. The, the, the love you feel for somebody doesn't mean anything. It's just some uh, neuron chemicals firing. That's all it is. It's a hormonal thing. Nothing means nothing. All there is is materiality. I mean, think about that. How could you truly stay alive and, and bother with the trouble of life with that mindset? Uh, if there's nothing, if nothing's going to matter once you're gone, why not just be gone now and get over it, with, get it over with, right? You know, um, <clears throat> what's what's the point? You know, so I find that uh, atheists who take it all the way to that 100% complete dire end tend not to last very long. They go crazy or they go depressed or they kill themselves or whatever. But uh, everybody looks for, you know, is searching for something. And <clears throat> the reason why people who are searching go to a lot of things other than Christ is because the, this is what's terrifying about Aslan. This is what's terrifying in a different way. You realize he's going to expect something from you. You are going to have to give something up. It's kind of hard to talk about this without going into my full spiel, but I don't really want to do it so segmented like this. So maybe I'll just try and put a pin in it and we'll come back to it after the stream. But her, when Jill says, I'll just have to go find another stream then, there is no other stream. You're never going to be happy with whatever else you try out. You'll be happy for a little while. You know, if you mm -hmm. find your, you know, your bliss or your um, spiritual intentment in your, in your hobbies, like music or something, or, or art or movies or whatever, or, um, or you're, you know, just really trying to be kind and being of service to people, you know, charity or whatever, it'll work for a little while, but it's not going to sustain you. It's not going to really quench that thirst. There's only one stream that quenches the thirst. Mm -hmm. And you have to deal with the lion who's there. You know, you can't get around it. And the lion does not promise not to do anything to you. In fact, he will do something to you. He's not going to harm you or hurt you or kill you, but he's going to change you irrevocably. And that's what terrifies us. He's going to kill off a part of us, you know, quite literally. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> like, like I said, it's it's a faith. I mean, we we hunger or thirst or whatever for something. and she she finds it and she has to have faith that she's not gonna get eaten yeah uh, so there's there's that little interplay there it's like she's she is she is finding something and open, opening herself up to to having faith in him mm -hmm. specifically yeah and and as they <clears throat> excuse me as they talk we also see this this theme that we've seen every time somebody talks to aslan Every time you're before God, your impurities are blatantly obvious to you. You know, your sin is always, even if it was a sin you didn't quite know was a sin, or if uh, you did some behavior that you hadn't quite been thinking about in, that, in those terms, it'll become immediately uh, obvious to you. <clears throat> you know, you can't be in the presence of Christ without realizing how unworthy you truly are. Now, and, the way around, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, so, well, like you mentioned that, it's like almost every time someone comes across him, it's almost like when they, they look at them and then they can't look at them for long, they have to put their head down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, I, I know what's inside. I'm just, it's almost like I'm not worthy to look at you mm -hmm. for any length of time. Yeah. And this is why during the mass, once the bread is, the bread and wine are consecrated and you're there in the physical presence of Christ, you know, up there on the altar, it's not just, you know, 
oh, God's around, Jesus is around us all the time. Yeah, but you're there in the actual physical presence of, of your king of the universe. What do we say? The, the mass, uh, you know, the, the entire congregation recites or quotes the uh, the centurion from, from Matthew, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Uh, it's acknowledging your unworthiness before God, but acknowledging his grace and mercy too, that will extend to you once you've realized, once you've admitted, once you've, you know, uh, been honest with yourself and how you are. So we see that reflected in their, in their conversation here. Human child, said the lion, where is the boy? He fell over the cliff, said Jill, and added, sir, she didn't know what else to do to call him. And it sounded cheek to call him nothing. How did he come to do that, human child? He was trying to stop me from falling, sir. Why? Why, why were you so near to the edge, human child? I was showing off, sir. That is a very good answer, human child. Do so no more. And now, here for the first time, the lion's face became a little less stern. The boy is safe. I have blown him to Narnia, but your task will be harder because of what you have done. And then she, she asked what task. So uh, the fact that she says, I was showing off, that's, that's a confession. Mm -hmm. I, I sinned. I did something I shouldn't do. I was doing this. She doesn't try to hide it. She doesn't try to justify it. She just says it. And Aslan, that's a very good answer. Now, don't do it again. And then he's done. There's no chastisement there because confession was made. Once confession is made, you know, and, and the, and the mercy is given, then, you know, God says he remem doesn't remember your sin. Once you've, you're walking in repentance and, and you've, uh, you've asked for forgiveness, you know, and you've made that confession. So, um, but he doesn't he doesn't ignore the fact that because she did this sin, there are consequences in her life. Yeah. And this is the, the penance, you know, or, or right. um, it does change things. There are temporal consequences to our sin that we'll still have to deal with, even though we're forgiven of the sin. So it's going to be her task is going to be harder now because she did that. And Eustace ended up falling off the cliff. Now it's only she's there to listen to Aslan's instructions. Now she has to remember everything he says and then go try and get Eustace to listen to her and stuff. So it's going to be a little more difficult. So she he tells her three or I think it's three three or four instructions. Let me try and do you know do you see where the instructions are? He says to her. Um do, 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 uh yeah, I will tell you, child, said the lion, there are signs by which I will guide you in your quest. First, as soon as the boy Eustace sets foot in Narnia, he will meet an old and dear friend. He must greet that friend at once. If he does, you will both have good help. Second, you must journey out of Narnia to the north till you come to the ruined city of the ancient giants. Third, you shall find a writing on a stone in that ruined city, and you must do what the writing tells you. Fourth, you will know the lost prince, if you find him, by this, that he will be the first person you have met in your travels who will ask you to do something in my name in the name of Aslan. Yeah. And that's when she realizes who he is there. So yeah, four, four instructions, four signs that she is to, to use on her journey. And he makes her remember them. He makes her recite them, makes her remember them. And this is like, you know, Bible verses almost, you know, um, mm -hmm. instructions you can, you liken them to before he ends up blowing her as well across the sea and, and uh, across the land. So you get the idea that he's, they're basically at the end of the world. They're basically in Aslan's country, you know, um, and they're and, and he, they're riding the wind as he blows the air. They're riding the wind off to to Aslan. <clears throat> yeah, so she, he, go ahead. he blows her. Well, I'm probably getting ahead of it about about what she sees as she's going away. Yeah, go ahead. You, you find out she she's going uh, west, mm -hmm. and she's looking down, and we see all the islands. Says, yeah, he's in his land, and that's yep. that's kind of how you figure it out. Yeah, that's why they're so far up. You know, it's uh. So in chapter three, we realized that uh, he must have, have blown the air a bit faster to get her there because she lands on Narnia just a few minutes after Scrub lands, after Eustace lands. And they're landing there at the at the sea, and they don't know where they're at. Remember, Eustace has only ever been on the Dawn Treader. He never actually was in Narnia proper, you remember, in the journey. So he doesn't recognize where they are. They do ask the owl, uh, Glimfeather is the owl's name, right, Al? Or, mm -hmm. Glimfeather, yeah. Yeah, Glimfeather. <clears throat> you know, wh where are they? And they realize, oh, they're actually at Care Paravel. They're at the royal palace of Narnia. And there's an old man, an old king. You know, he's got the crown on his head. This old, uh, you know, weathered, wizened uh, king about to set sail. And, and that's all the people are out there 
to, to see him off. We see Trumpkin, the dwarf, you know, who's going to stand regent, but he's so old and he's sitting in a bunch of pillows. You know, he's like in this carrier. <laughs> he's, he's hard of hearing. He's pretty much deaf. Yeah. <clears throat> he's got one of these horns around his head, you know, with the ear and stuff, you know. Um, and and Jill tries to tell Eustace immediately the sign. Remember, she's supposed to tell him these things right away. Mm -hmm. And she tells him, do you see anybody you recognize? Do you see anybody you recognize? You're supposed to, you know, and he's kind of uh, abrupt with her. He doesn't want to listen to her, right? Eustace doesn't want to admit he's he's the one that's been there before. He's, he's the a, one that knows. He, he was bratty. See, I yeah. told you. That's what he, he was being a little nudge. <laughs> well, he's not a brat in general, but yeah, this is that bratty behavior when between the two of them. He can't admit, or he doesn't want to admit, at least at first. We see it a number of times that she's there with him. She's just as important as him now. You know, he's the one that's been there before. As Narnia is his, you know, and uh, because he doesn't take the time to listen to her and take the time to really hear what she's saying, and the fact that she's come from Aslan, the the king ends up setting sail, and we realize that that was Caspian. He realizes too that the the time has uh is is been playing with him in the difference between Narnia and our world again, where it's been many, 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 many years since the last time he saw Caspian. Caspian's an old man now, and if he'd have mentioned our our revealed himself as Eustace Caspian would have known he knew about the time difference and he would have been able to set them on their way with royal guards and army give them all the resources they'd need uh as it is they have to make do so Glimfeather introduces them to Trumpkin tries to anyway <laughs> it's very hard because <laughs> Trumpkin's so hard of hearing and it's pretty comical you know the different things he mishears and thinks that they're saying um uh, but Trumpkin realizes that they are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve so therefore they should be treated with respect because Trumpkin remembers. I mean, he, this is our guy from the silver chair, you know, who's with the high King Peter and, and the whole crew. So, uh, so he, he has them come over, stay the night, have a good dinner and everything like that. And in the morning he'll hear about their mission or whatever. So they have a nice feast. They, they, they end up dressing, you know, and they're staying in the, in the, in the castle apartments there they're given, but Glimfeather, the owl were with Jill at this point and Glimfeather, uh, pecks at the window. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it, we're in chapter four now. Glimfeather pecks at the window and says that she must uh, she must go with Glimfeather. He must ride, uh, give her. She must climb on his back and ride to this place. That they, if if they are to find the prince, if she really wants to find the prince, and she says yes, you know this is the task Aslan's given us. They have to go. <clears throat> so they're um, she drives uh, one of her one of his. Uh, he's already born Eustace. He's already taken Eustace there. So now he's taking her, and they end up where they they end up in this like it's almost like a. Um, like a Stonehenge kind of looking place, isn't it? I forget the description of the place where they end up being. It's like a secret place at night. Yeah, it's it's like that. Yeah, the, the Parliament of Owls in chapter mm -hmm. four. So we're, yeah. We're going next. yeah, yeah, that's where we are now. Yeah, and uh, so they're there, and they're about to speak to to Eustace and Jill. And Eustace speaks up first, and I like this. He says, "Wait, wait, wait! Before you say anything, <clears throat> you know, I am the king's man." He says, <laughs> "If this is some secret Parliament against the king." You know, and, and it's a fair question because they're meeting outside of the palace at secret at night, but he realizes we're meeting at night because they're owls. That's where they meet. You know, that's mm -hmm. when they're up, you know. Um, but it turns out that they're not trying to go against the king or Trumpkin, but Trumpkin has been sworn to stop and not let anybody go search for the lost prince because we find out a little bit of details there, and I'll get to that in a second. But everybody who's gone to search for the prince has never come back. So Trumpkin wouldn't allow them to go just because he's being true to Caspian's order. And again, it makes it, you know, all the more tragic if Ca if Eustace had been acknowledged by Caspian, they're recognized rather then he would have allowed them to go and search. Cause he knows that Aslan brings, you know, sons and Adam, daughters of Adam and Eve to, uh, to that land for those kinds of reasons. <clears throat> so, uh, they find out what this, uh, why the prince has gone missing. Do you remember how many years it's been since the prince is missing out? I didn't, you know, it's a number, so I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> oh, um, uh, not really. I mean, it's, it's been quite a long time. Yeah. I, why, why does 10 years stick in my head? But maybe I, I don't think it was that, that long. Well, it actually starts. The, the, the story starts when it was the prince out with his mother, who of course was Ramindu's, you know, the star's right. daughter. They were out, uh, you know, in an outing, a picnic or something like that. And this magical serpent, this green magical serpent bit the it queen. Was, it was about 10 years ago, it appeared, when Rillian, the son of Caspian, was a very young knight. And he rode with the queen and his mother on a May morning in the north parts of Narnia. Mm -hmm. So she's bitten by this serpent. And uh, Rillian... Prince Rillian comes back, you know, the Caspian son, 
comes back and and catches you know the serpent in the, on the act or whatever but the serpent's too sly he can't catch the serpent away and his mother's actually dying literally he sees her there dying so he doesn't give chase too far and uh and his mother dies <clears throat> so really and is is starts to set out uh over the over the year is it a year after that or something he keeps setting out to try and find the serpent to exact revenge uh Drinian, our, our good friend Captain mm -hmm. Drinian of the of the Dawn Treader, eventually tells the prince, "You have to give this up. It's it's if it's just a beast, then there's no revenge you can get on a beast. It was just you know a dumb beast. It wasn't one of the talking animals of Narnia, our sentient being." And really, at that time, says, "No, I have given it up. I have given it up." There, there's it's a well, right? Is it a well that they are that they uh, she was bitten around that they keep going towards? Uh, it was something. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Something like that, but uh, really, and says no. I've uh, I'm giving up the revenge, but I've 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 seen a vision of such great beauty that I can't not go search for it again. And Journey and says, "Well, let me see it as well." So he allows Journey in to come with him, and they go to the same place where his mother was bitten. And really, and sees this woman, this woman who's just so amazingly beautiful, so alluring to him. Yeah, and um, what's up? It was a a, gr a glade with a with a where there was a fountain. Okay. Fountain, yes, right, yeah. So not well, well but freshly out of the earth, yeah, yeah. So a natural well, yeah, <laughs> fountain, and uh, really, and is so taken by this woman's beauty, and she ends up wearing a dress as green and as almost scale like as the serpent itself. So, uh, mm -hmm. hearing the tale, Eustace and Paul they they put together the idea that uh, this is probably the same serpent. It was a magical woman, a witch, or whatever could trans transform herself. Uh, he goes out again, and really, ends lost. Journey in eventually comes clean and tells the king of everything that uh, had happened. It's a really touching moment too, because the really and asked Drinian not to tell anybody, not to tell the king, of course, not to tell anybody what he saw and Drinian. Okay. You're the prince. I'll respect that. But once really and goes missing, Drinian realizes it's probably this woman and I've kind of messed up. So Drinian goes to King Caspian and it's a really sweet kind of moment because at first, Drinian says, uh, you know, you'll have to fire me, slay me now, you know, my lord, because I'm the reason why Rillian's left. And he tells him that I kept this secret. I kept this secret. And King Caspian, overcoming grief at first, grabs up a sword as though he's going to slay Drinian. But he drops the sword immediately. And he says, I've lost my my wife. And now my son, am I, am I to lose my best friend too? You know, he has that cognizant moment. And I just like those moments where Lewis puts into the stories of natural grief, real natural grief that overcomes your logical circuits, but then you stop, you know, if you have faith, if you have logic, you stop and realize, you know, this is when forgiveness is needed. This is when this is that and it's needed, you know, and it's a, it's a sweet moment and they, they embrace there. And, um, yeah. you know, in his grief, they share the grief. Uh, it was an ax, not a sword, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Al's very particular about those With medieval weapons. <laughs> weapons, you know, deserve an ax deserves respect. <laughs> And my axe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, the Glenfeather and the owls are telling Jill and, and uh, Eustace about this. And they tell them that, you know, so here's what you need to do. Uh, let's say Sound Engraver says, I wonder if Lewis was inspired by Orpheus and Eurydice for the mother's death, where Eurydice is bitten by a serpent. I was thinking that exact same thing. Of course, Orpheus has to go into the underworld. We're going to see something like that here, you know? Yeah. So, so is, is, you know, Lewis was a classicist. Lewis knew classical myth. That was his thing, you know, whereas Tolkien was drew a lot of inspiration from the Norse. Uh, Lewis was a classicist, Greek myth and whatnot. So, yeah, it's definitely uh, shadows of Eurydice and, and Orpheus, um, as, as we'll even go into the underworld later, as we'll see. So, yeah, definitely that. Uh, they do say, okay, where are you going to go? Well, we'll, Jill says the second sign. We have to go to the city of the giants in the north, you know, this special city. The owls are very uncomfortable with this idea. <laughs> they make it known that this is something's dangerous about this. And it's a nice little tension going into chapter five. <clears throat> In chapter five, we we uh they, they say, okay, well, if, if you're gonna go that far, you need to we need to introduce them to the marsh wiggles, get one of the marsh wiggles to help them, you know, take mm -hmm. them up to the marshes. So they they <laughs> take them up to the north here. Go ahead. Oh, the fact that all this time after after a while, Jill just fell asleep. Well, yeah, it's been such a day. like rattling, 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 and then boom, she's. It's like yeah. if you ready, the glim feather to girl. It's like I think she, I think pulls asleep and scrum. Yeah, and then and then feels uh, uh, 
weak because she fell asleep. You know, it's all the competition mm-hmm. with Scrub. He didn't. But uh, they do go meet Puddleglum, and uh, <laughs> he's right away. He's this wonderful kind of character. So uh, what does she say? Um, they meet Puddleglum. Oh, come on. Okay. Chilly wind was blowing, and they appeared to be in a place without trees. To who, to who, Glimfeather was calling. Wake up, Puddle Glum. Wake up. It's on the lion's business. For a long time, there was no reply. Then a long way off, a dim light appeared and began to come near. With it came a voice. Owls ahoy, it said. What is it? The king's dead? Has an enemy landed in Narnia? Is it a flood or dragons? You know, thinking it's bad news every time. When the light reached them, it turned out to be that of a large lantern. Joe could see very little of the person who held it. He seemed to be all legs and arms. The owls were uh, were talking to him, explaining everything, but she was too tired to listen. She tried herself to uh, wake herself a bit. She realized that they were saying goodbye to her, but she could never afterwards remember much except that sooner or later, she and Scrub were stopped, stooping to enter a low doorway, and then, oh, thank heaven, were lying down on something soft and warm, and a voice was saying, there you are, best we can do. You'll lie all cold and hard, damp too, I shouldn't wonder. Won't sleep a wink, most likely, even if there isn't a thunderstorm or a flood or the wigwam doesn't full f- fall down on top of us all. As I've known them do, must make the best of it. But she was asleep before the voice ended. So she's asleep. Eventually they wake up. Um, we're on North Are We? And the wigwam of the Marsh Wiggle said, use this a what? A Marsh Wiggle. Don't ask me what it is. I couldn't see it last night. I'm getting up. Let's go and look for it. Uh, how beastly are so then they... um. I'm just trying to give you some of the you uh, some of uh, Puddle Glum's kind of character. When they finally meet Ke- uh, Puddle Glum in the light, uh, I'm just gonna get the description of him here. They see all the the wigwams of the Marsh Wiggles out there. They can see where they are. <clears throat> the Marsh Wiggles speak to him as, as they a, drew near the. Yeah. Oh yeah, you want to read it? Yeah, go ahead. Well, there you go ahead. I was just trying to help you find it. Yeah, you, you can read it though if you want. But. As they drew nearer, the figure turned its head and showed them a long, thin face with rather sunken cheeks, a tightly shut mouth, sharp nose, and no beard. Well, see, that's Puddle, not Puddal. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) He was wearing a high-pointed hat like a steeple with an enormously wide, flat brim. The hair, if it could be called hair, which hung over his large ears was greeny gray. And each lock was flat rather rather than round, so that they were like tiny reeds. His expression was solemn, his complexion muddy, and you could see at once that he took a serious view of life. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> and I'll read his, his dialogue here just to get a, a t- taste of his, his personality. Good morning, guests, he said. Though when I say good, I don't mean it won't probably turn to rain or it might be snow or fog or thunder. You didn't get any sleep, I dare say. Yes, we did, though, said Jill. We had a lovely night. Ah, said the Marsh Wiggle, shaking his head. I see you're making the best of it. A bad job. That's right. You've been well brought up. You have. You learned to put a good face on things. And that's that's what he does every time somebody says, no, this is actually great. He's like, oh, good job. Good putting a good face on it. You know, that's what you should do. Good, that's the spirit. You know, it's, mm-hmm. there's no there's no cheering put Al Glum up. But the thing is, he's not really depressed. He just is constantly glass half empty, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I totally agree. Santa Gravis says uh, Anthony Daniels would be a great putt out glum. Yeah, I do see a little bit of a, a C-3PO. I mean, C-3PO is not that negative, but I do see some of that in there, definitely. Well, do you see who played him in the live action version that they did? No, the, the BBC one? Who? BBC, Tom Baker, the fourth doctor. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one of the doctors. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Oh, I was looking I up for a picture. I saw a bunch of pictures of Tom Baker with the big pointy hat, and okay. just that because he has that savage face. Yeah, which was perfect. I haven't seen the. I only saw the BBC live uh, action of Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. I haven't seen any of the other ones of those they made a long time ago. Um, so uh, Puddle Glum ends up. Uh, I keep saying Put Al Glum. Now I keep thinking that <laughs> he uh, they, they catch some eels. He's making a stew. And he's trying to uh, talk to them about, you know, what their what their plans are. And at one point he says, yeah, we shall have a hard time of it. And they say, we, oh, you're coming with us. And he says, well, absolutely, I'm coming with you. And we find out that the reason he's coming with them is because he can't pass up a chance like this. Because after all, the other Marsh Wiggles are telling him, 
you're too you're too optimistic, Puddle Glum. You're too you know uh, given to to high spirits and given to <laughs> to the glass half full kind of mentality. And and he said, this is what I need. It needs a good adventure to kind of bring me back down to earth and show me that things don't always work out right. You know, so you wonder like, man, what are the rest of the Marsh Wiggles like if he's supposed to be the optimist of them? You know, and uh, we do see Eustace gets a little upset at one point. Like if you're just going to be glum like this and and you know talk down everything, just don't even come with us. You know and it's funny because this is Puddle Glum's negative personality, but there is some truth to it. He says, oh, it was it was inevitable. You know, adventures like this, the the uh, the team, the heroes always fall out with each other. Let's not do it yet. But but yep, you know, here it goes. And uh, every time Eustace and Jill get into a little argument about something or in their competitive natures, Puddle Glum says, oh, there it goes. I knew it wasn't long before we'd all start bickering and fall apart. <laughs> and then they shut up real quick. You know, it's kind of like. It, it's kind of like when you see uh, when you uh, your bad behavior or something you don't like about yourself, you see it exhibited in somebody else or they call it out in a way that you find annoying in them because you do it yourself and you struggle with it. I'm not mm -hmm. explaining that really correctly well, but it's a great picture of that is that they think it's so annoying that Puddle Glum is always negative about everything. But when he's actually right because of their bad behavior it strikes a chord and they suddenly they stop arguing, you know, they don't want it to, to, to uh, they don't want him to be right. You know, it, they do uh, at the end of the chapter, they agree that they're going to be taking off to this, uh, the next sign, right? The, the, the city of the giants, the land of the giants to the North. Right. He's going to take them there. And they don't know as Puddle Glum says, you know, Cas Eustace says Caspian did say that he had uh, sub subjugated the giants to the North. They paid tribute to Narnia and there was peace. And Puddle Glum says, yes, that's true, uh, but they're still giants, you know, and, and they're, you know, a lot of things could go wrong if they don't forget themselves. If we remain sort of unseen, maybe things can go OK, but they're still in the land of giants who aren't like uh, what was the giant rumble uh, that, that fought with King Caspian in the in Prince Caspian. I forget that one, but they're not giants yeah, who live in Narnia and they're good giants. So they are bad giants who they've been made peace with. They've, you know, they kind of brought them to sub subjection. So. Uh, and that's where we, we wrap up. We wrap up that we're there off, you know, they're, they're about to go into the giants. The next, the next chapter six for next week is the wild Westlands of the North wild wastelands rather of the North. And so it's a nice, uh, nice introduction to, to this world, to this time period of Narnia, how much time's gone by. We know our characters. Now we know the, uh, the motivations that they each have. They, they've got a shared trauma. They're, they're shared, uh, from this bully and from this horrible experience of the school but they're still competitive with each other. So we set up the tensions to come. There's this, they both want to do Aslan's will. They both want to find this prince and uh, you know, Eustace's allegiance to Caspian Jill's new allegiance to Aslan. She's met him now. And uh, but they do have this competition with each other. So how are they going to learn to work together, you know, and not, not compete. It's kind of a, a new, new field of exploration for Eustace because his competition in the last book was with people who were older than him, so much more obviously suited to the adventure than he was, which hardened his heart even more at first until he had the, the giant, I mean, the dragon experience. Now, though, he's the experienced one. He's the one, and he's got to learn to have mercy and grace with, with Jill, who's feeling perhaps a little bit like Eustace did that first time. So it's an interesting place to put your characters in, you know, in a sequel book. And, and even though you've got somebody like Eustace, who's had that encounter with Aslan, he's had such a change in his life and he's a de decent person. Now you can still show growth happening. You can still show the need for growth happening. Mm -hmm. You know, so Lewis does a good job of that. Any uh, thoughts of, on any of the last chapters there from you, Al? Anything you I missed or anything you want to bring up? Uh, no, it's just, a, uh, it's a great little threesome mm -hmm. because, because you've got the, the downer yeah. and, um, and then you've got these two kids who are, mm -hmm. so it, it'll just be, it'll be interesting to uh, see. Cause they've already, they've already missed the first sign mm -hmm. when, and that they got in, got into it a little bit because he kept putting her off and yeah you know, not realizing that it was the old, the old King was actually mm -hmm. the old friend. So yeah. If he'd taken uh, the time to listen to her, but he couldn't yeah. listen to her because this is his place. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, you know, those two going back and forth are, is an interesting dynamic. And now you add, um, puddle glum in there. It'll be, 
it'll be interesting to see what how these, yeah. how these three <clears throat> interact and get things done. It is interesting because they need they need a guide slash chaperone ish. You know, they're kids in this land and they need mm-hmm. some sort of guide. And uh, Melissa Harris is asking, kind of, what is Puddle Gum? Is he a wizard? Is he fair? No, he's a marsh wiggle. And you get the idea that marsh wiggles are swamp people. They have webbed hands and feet. They're, they're like, a, of, like a human frog hybrid. Yeah, yeah. I get the uh, I get the sense that they're almost like what Smeagol would have been a hobbit like character or whatever. Although he's quite tall, he's got the body of basically a dwarf, but it just his arms and legs are so long, you know. Mm-hmm. So he's like a sort of loon like, but uh, webbed feet, webbed hands, and he's uh, green. he's an interesting character. Yeah, like green kind of. Yeah, Look like some very amphibian looking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's uh, it's interesting because if you had chosen a character who was super wise, uh, super together, had it together, uh, you know, was both smart, was both everything like that, then you wouldn't, it wouldn't still be their story in like the children's mm-hmm. adventure. You know, you'd have a problem there if they, if they if they were with a Gandalf type character or something. You know, the, 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 if there was a true adult in the picture then he would take everything in tow and in, in hand and he'd handle everything. But by having Puddle Glum, who is sort of an adult in his own right, is an adult marsh wiggle or whatever, but he's also not quite there enough to give it to, you know, still their adventure. I'll share a, a screen of some images of him. I still, I still like how you say Puddle Glum. <laughs> I keep saying it. I know. I know. Um, Just real quick. Uh, where do we leave off for next time? Uh, We're going to go through chapter go 11. Through Okay, so no, 11. chapter 10. Chapter 10. Are we going to chapter just because our 16 in the book? Yeah, we're going to do six chapters for last, but we'll just do chapter oh, okay. uh, five through 10 next time. But here are some images. This is the Tom Baker that uh, Al's talking about here uh, in the live action, which I guess Tom Baker does kind of look more like a, a wizard <laughs> a little bit when he's in the like, but this is some, some uh, illustrations. The marsh, I like this one. This is good. Let me, um, you see that you see the one where I got, yeah middle there yeah this is a good one let me see if i can open this uh up here and i'll zero it in this is about what he would look like there we go so that's uh he's almost kind of like a scarecrow ish you know type character but you see the webbed feet I thought it was webbed hands too, but it's just webbed feet. You know, sort of duck feet for walking around, perhaps swimming around. I thought he had swamp. webbed hands too. I thought he was described as webbed hand, but this this image doesn't give him webbed hands. But uh, let's see if I can find that other one. This, this is the one that Al picked out is good. Got a big pointy nose. Yeah, long nose. It was the only one I could find that it was looking rather straight on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so that's Puddle Puddle Glum, but Puddle Gum. Yeah, he's got the webbed hands there. Yeah. So kind of frog like, basically a frog person, you know, <laughs> like a frog's long legs. Yeah, cool character, cool type of character. I've never really. You know, Lewis is a classicist and he does pull a lot of characters or, or beings from from uh for Narnia from from mythology, but I don't really remember ever seeing a uh or, or hearing about a character who is a frog like person from myth. Unless I'm just you know, just off the, t- the top of my head right now, probably there might be something that he's drawing you from, but it could just be a completely invented character. So Yeah, it could have uh kind of a creation with um like the what are they? Not they're not um, they're not mermaids, but the nymphs that are in the water, not dryads. Oh, uh, naiads. Naiads. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but not them because there are naiads in Narnia, so it's not technically a naiad. You know, it's something different. Yeah. No, but I'm 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 saying like you know, kind of maybe drawing mm-hmm. inspiration from something yeah. like that. If there was like a specific swampy kind of version of that, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's something something in uh, mythology that's uh, uh, that's analogous. Yeah, yeah. So that's all we have for tonight. Here, uh, we are going to um, tech back in with chapters six through ten next week. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Any last words from you, Al, or anything? Um, no, just for, just uh, just 
and enjoying it. And uh, I think it's interesting that the two books we're doing, this one and the other one, are both revolving around very bad schools. Yeah. <laughs> starting, starting off with very bad schools. That's right. That's right. Thursday, we continue our uh, study through Red Harvest, the Star Wars EU book, which is a very wicked Sith Academy. Yeah, it got very got interesting. I was yeah. like, the little taken moment. I don't yeah. Know. I, I got a nice, nice, I'm uh, nice... I have a man with a very special set of skills. That's right. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I mean, you just blatantly ripped that off. It was, it was kind of like with a wink to the audience. I think, Almost too. word for word, too. Yeah. yeah. If you bring her back now, you'll go unharmed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. So, uh, so yeah, that's Thursday night. Um, are you doing something with uh, Daniel and uh, Major Boomer tomorrow? Or uh, no, they are um, going to have Leah Plus Size as their guest, and they're watching the uh, first Captain America film. Oh, cool! Excellent. Because this uh, this Friday on I know Disney Plus is the Falcon and uh, the Winter Soldier series starts, and everybody will say it's actually really good. You should watch it. It's actually really good. Might be. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and. Uh, is, is are you doing the re no you did quiet man this last i did weekend. quiet man last weekend uh this weekend we are doing uh, uh a few good men on matters network matters network okay cool yeah you want us on that stream you need us on that stream <laughs> <laughs> so uh so that's that i uh don't have the energy in me right now to give the whole little pre-show thing i was talking about so i might just try and record it as a video mm -hmm. or else i'll do it um there's a live stream and cut it out as a video later, but I do have some things I wanted to talk about. So I'm thinking about things lately, uh, how specifically how, how we're built for religion We're built for religion, a religious experience and all the trappings that that means, you know, cause I was, you know, grew up in that and, and Protestantism depends on what strain of Protestantism you, you, you're, you're talking about or whatever, but the Protestantism in America is kind of stemming from that idea of get away from all these religious trappings and just get down to a relationship. And, uh, and it's a mis it's a misguided notion because religion is there in order to have a relationship, you know, um, mm -hmm. true religion is. So anyway, we'll, we'll get into that more and I'll have my thoughts all ordered and the energy to, to get all into that. But, um, are we doing something Friday night? I believe. Is I he, is, is fan man doing something Friday? Uh, I, I think, I, I think this is the week he said we were doing something. Yeah. Wasn't so it? there could be a fan man and his fantastic friends on Friday night. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Keep a look out for that. Of course, my next stream will be a classic 1962 King Kong versus Godzilla. Oh, the that's original. right. The original. The original, the original Smackdown. Versus... The original Clash of the Titans. And are you watching the American version or the Japanese version? The American version. And okay. it's on YouTube, so it's readily available. Or at least okay. it has been. So we'll see. Cool. So that's next Saturday night. Yeah. Next Saturday, 27th. Sonic Graver says... Uh... Oh, Pruff, uh, said Pruff getting on Al about Marvel. She said, come on, Al. It's my birthday. Don't bring it down. <laughs> I right. am the anti Marshall goal. <laughs> you are. That's right. It's kind of uh, weird to see your uh, face on pedal glum there. Uh, but, oh, Daniel Heron says there's no show tomorrow due to weather. Okay, so it's oh. actually canceled. Captain oh. America's canceled tomorrow so due to weather. So Sorry. Really? Okay. <laughs> are you guys having, like, storms down there? Um wind hurricanes rain or, or is it snowing down there again i don't know we did get a cold snap it got really cold here today again all of a sudden and we had a little warm yeah, weather so good yeah it was nice uh, so <laughs> not quite ready to, to go without the cold completely you know i'm glad spring is I like easing good, in i like a good cold snap <laughs> yeah yeah so uh all right folks well thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us tonight it's been fun digging into silver chair and silver chair just gets better and better it really is a wonderful read so come back next week for some really sweet chapters there too um tornado daniel heron says okay yeah well, we'll pray oh. for daniel heron and uh, his his uh folks down there around where he lives and everything definitely so you yeah, know tor no tornadoes hopefully that'll just be a, a watch that's uh unfruitful but we'll see so uh thanks for hanging out and until next time uh, god bless <laughs>